by Yahweh himself, by his voice, he pronounced the commandments. We read in verse 18, And all the people saw the thunderings, and the lightnings, and the noise of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. Now, knowing your Bible as well as you do, you will know immediately that that phrase, afar off, is a phrase pregnant with meaning, isn't it? It strikes a chord with us at once, doesn't it? That, brothers and sisters, is where the Gentiles are, isn't it? They were the ones who were far off. Israel were called to be near to God. And here they are giving up their immense privilege of being called to be those who are near to God, those who are nigh to him, especially chosen people who in Exodus 19 God had just said should be near to him. And they have removed and taken up the position of the Gentiles. They stand now afar off by choice. So that's rather sad, isn't it, that Israel have, have opted for that because of their fear, because of their terror at hearing the voice of God. Now, we don't have to surmise what that meant, brothers and sisters, because there are in our Bibles two divinely inspired commentaries on this incident, and it's those that we wish to look at in Maine this evening. The first is in Deuteronomy chapter 5, the verses that our brother Tony has read for us. So perhaps we can go there now, Deuteronomy chapter 5, and uh, verses 22 to 29. Deuteronomy 5 and verse 22. These words, and that's a reference to the ten words that we spoke about last night, the ten commandments, which Moses has in mind here. These words, the Lord spake, Yahweh spake, unto all your assembly in the mount, out of the midst of the fire, of the cloud, and of the thick darkness with a great voice. And he added no more, and he wrote them in two tables of stone, and delivered them unto me. So, those are words that Moses is talking about, the Ten Commandments, and he says they were uttered by a, a great voice. Strong's give the me- gives the meaning of that word great as exceeding high, or exceedingly loud. A great voice, not just an ordinary voice, a great, exceedingly loud voice. This is 24 and 25 quite illuminating, aren't they? Israel said, Behold, the Lord our God hath showed us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God doth talk with man and he liveth. Amazing. Yahweh had spoken to them and they were still alive. Then they add, verse 25, Now therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord, our God, any more, then we shall die. That's quite remarkable, isn't it? We've survived it once, they're saying. We might not survive it a second time. That seems to be their rather illogical response to this, doesn't it? A very strange way of of reasoning that God has manifested himself to us and we're still alive, we have survived this theophany such as it was, but we don't want to go through it again. We don't go through it again. We may not survive it again, we may die. And so in verse 26, you noticed, as, as we read it perhaps, they're saying, well, thank you very much, but no thanks. That's in effect what they're saying, isn't it? Verse 26, Who is there of all flesh that have heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and lived. Thank you very much. This is an immense privilege. We appreciate it, but we don't want it any more. And so, verse 27, they say, give us a mediator and we will obey. 
Go thou near, they speak to Moses. Hear all that the Lord, our God, shall say. Speak thou unto us all that the Lord, our God, shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and do it. And they promise their obedience to a mediator. And in verse 28, God says that Israel are right to say that. That a mediator is required. And God acknowledges that. And then he says, with some wistfulness, verse 29, Oh, that they would listen and obey. Oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments. There's a, a real sadness about that verse, brothers and sisters, isn't there? Oh, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might go well with them and with their children forever. God knows that it's not going to be like that, brothers and sisters. He knows the waywardness of his people Israel and he knows that they will not listen and they will not obey the mediator. So there in Deuteronomy 5 is a commentary for us on those verses we looked at in Exodus 19. Quite clearly, as Moses recounts the events of the giving of the Ten Commandments, he recognizes in Israel a desire not to hear the voice of God any further, their request for a mediator, and God's recognition that that request is absolutely right. But at the same time, God's recognition also that they would not be true to their word. We'll now come to the second commentary, please, which is found in our New Testament in the letter to the Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. Here in Hebrews chapter 12 is another divinely inspired commentary which helps us to understand exactly what was going on at Sinai and how God saw the issues. And here in Hebrews chapter 12 and uh, verse 18, verses 18 to 21, those are just the verses that we shall look at. The refusal of Israel to hear the voice of God at Mount Sinai, their removing and standing afar off, their desire that God will not speak to them anymore, but that Moses will speak to them on his behalf, is seen, brothers and sisters, as prophetic. As a prophecy of their refusal in every generation to hear the word of God. Their refusal to hear and obey generally, spiritually. Not just to refuse to hear the voice, physically, literally, but their refusal to accept what is said. Their refusal throughout their history. The events at Mount Sinai are here seen as prophetic of their disobedience in every generation. That's how Sinai is looked at in these passages. How the words, their words in Deuteronomy chapter 5 are interpreted here and extended, given that meaning. That Israel were prophesying their own disobedience throughout their national history in what they said at Mount Sinai when they removed and stood afar off and said, don't let's hear the voice of God anymore. And that's quite something, isn't it? I wonder if we've read... Exodus 19 and Deuteronomy 5 in that way before, but quite clearly that's what is being said here, that their refusal to hear is more than just their terror at the, the audible sounds there on Mount Sinai. So verse 18 of Hebrews 12, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burnt with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard, entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they were not, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was sight that Moses said, 
I exceedingly fear and quake. Notice how even Moses physically was terrified by what they saw and heard. But it's verse 19 that we need to note particularly, brothers and sisters, it's their unwillingness. It's deliberate, you see. It was a deliberate decision that they made, which is being seen as prophetic, as we said, of their attitude and their behavior throughout their national history. The word of God, brothers and sisters, on that occasion at Sinai was uncomfortable. On that particular occasion, it was particularly uncomfortable to the ears. It was an exceedingly high and an exceedingly loud voice, a great voice. And the sound of the trumpet waxed louder and louder until you would run from the noise. It's like being in the presence of a a fire engine or an ambulance siren, isn't it, All, all the time. It impacts on the, on the eardrums in an unbearable way. The word of God was uncomfortable physically at Sinai. But you see, Israel interpreted that as seeing the word of God uncomfortable in spiritual terms too. It was demanding. It made demands with which Israel were uncomfortable. It made demands on them that they were not willing to accept and to which they were not prepared to submit. And that's the point, isn't it, here in Hebrews chapter 12. That's what here the writer has in mind. Compare, for example, verse 25 when he says to us, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. You see, that's how he interprets what Israel did. He interprets it as a refusal to hear him. And hear, in this context, means to hear and obey, of course. As so often in Scripture, it's not just hearing the sound, it's hearing and heeding, hearing and obeying. So he says, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refuse him that spake on earth, how much more shall not we escape? if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. So there, brothers and sisters, is the issue, isn't it? Made very clear for us in Hebrews 12, a divine commentary on the events at Mount Sinai. Israel's refusal to hear is what that was tantamount to. They're removing afar off. They're saying to Moses, don't let God speak to us anymore, was an attitude, a conduct that would characterize them all through their existence, a refusal to hear and accept whatever it was that God was saying to them and required of them. We'll come back, if you will, to Deuteronomy chapter 5. But come with me this time into the next chapter. We have seen how in Deuteronomy 5, Moses, first of all, rehearses the Ten Commandments as they were given in Exodus chapter 20. And then we've looked at verses 22 to 29, which is God's own commentary on what happened through Moses there at the end of Deuteronomy chapter 5. And then we come to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I want us to look for a few moments at what is said there in verses 1 to 9. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord, your God, commanded to teach you that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it. So there's the, the um, revision, as it were, uh, The the commandments are the issue here. Verse 2, these commandments are are to be taught to every generation, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. I just want you to notice the, the phrases and the, the uh, items here that we're, we're picking out that we want to pick up on again in just a moment. So, we've got the commandments, first of all, in verse 1, 
And in verse 2, we've got this idea of teaching. One son, and one son's son, and so on to every generation. Verse 3, hear therefore. There's the important word in this chapter. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that he may increase mightily as the Lord, God of thy fathers, hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. So, they are to make sure that they do hear, and hear again, the word hear means obey. Obedience is incorporated in that idea. So there again in verse 4, we'll come down and verse 5, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Verse 6, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. So verses 5 and 6 are very much about the heart, whether or not the heart is right with God. These precepts, these commandments, are to be retained in the heart. They are to love them. They're not a matter of academic assent. They are to be lived out in daily life. They are to be at the center of their affections. Duty is not to be perfunctory. They are to keep these commandments because of their love for God. Verse 7, we return to the idea that they are to teach their children. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And in verse 8, they are to bind them on their hands. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. They shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Whether or not that was ever intended to be literally uh, carried out, um, doesn't matter, brothers and sisters. Whether that's what they were supposed to do, or whether it was a, a spiritual idea, whether uh, in their minds these things had to be in everything they did, in all their work, all their actions, uh, and, and between their eyes, in everything that they looked at, in everything they saw, uh, really doesn't um, affect what we want to say this evening very much. And verse 9, And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Again, whether that was physically to be done, or whether it's the spiritual lesson that matters, uh, doesn't uh, occupy our attention very much this evening. The spiritual lessons are clear, aren't they? That's the issue that we want to notice, what God was trying to get over to the people of Israel here in what he said, was the importance of hearing, of living, and of teaching these commandments of his from a motive of love. Well, the spiritual lessons were very clear to Solomon. I'd like you now, if you will, perhaps keeping a finger or a bookmark in, in Deuteronomy 6 might be useful, but come with me please to Proverbs chapter, is, chapter 7. It seems to me that here we have a chapter in Proverbs which is, well, if not based on Deuteronomy 6, at least has many allusions to it. Proverbs chapter 7 and um, we really need all the chapter, verses 1 to 22, but obviously we won't read it all. Let's just try and pick out some of the ideas that we've seen there in Deuteronomy 6, and which recur very obviously here in the words of Solomon in Proverbs 7. First of all, we notice in verse 1, we've got the idea of the sun. That came in Deuteronomy 6, didn't it? The sun and the sun's sun. And we've got the idea of the commandment, too. The Ten Commandments had just been given back in Deuteronomy 5, you remember, or at least had been rehearsed by Moses. So, Proverbs 7 and verse 1, My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Verse 3. Bind them upon thy fingers. Write them upon the table of of thine heart. That's a very clear reference back, isn't it, to Deuteronomy chapter 6. 
And then we move into this graphic picture of the prostitute, the harlot that Solomon describes. And he describes here particularly what he calls a simple young man in the authorized version. Verse 7, I beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths, a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house. Now the house came into Deuteronomy 6 as well, didn't it? In a slightly different context, something about writing it on the doorposts of the house. But again, there is a a verbal coincidence there, at least, with Deuteronomy 6. And it's night. Verse 9, in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. You remember that these commandments were to be rehearsed, Deuteronomy 6 said, when they lay down at night, and when they rose up again in the morning. Even at night, they were to keep those commandments in mind. And here in verse 9 of Proverbs 7, that's not happening, clearly. The conclusion in in this chapter is in verse 24. We could uh, go on with with several of the verses here, which um, have uh, verbal links with um, Deuteronomy 6, but uh, coming down um, towards the end of, of this chapter, it's very clear that Solomon is saying that the children need to hearken, they need to hear, they need to to obey. Solomon is again bringing home the same lesson of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hearken ye children. And it's, it's clear, is it not, brothers and sisters, that really this parable of Solomon's is not literally about prostitutes, is it? For years as a young man, I'd I'd failed to understand that personally. I always read it in that way, this very graphic picture. And I I always thought, well, living in London for a spell as a a teenager, um, I I saw some of the the awful events that happen in, in most big cities in pretty well any country in the world. And I knew that there were those dangers, but I never really felt that that was a a particularly grave temptation for me, uh, and I I never really applied Proverbs 7 to myself uh, in that way. Of course, that's not really what it's about, is it, brothers and sisters? Not not for us. It it has that meaning, and and obviously, um, for any tempted in in that direction, I I suppose this is important advice. But that's not its purpose. That's not why it's here in Scripture. This, brothers and sisters, is a parable, quite clearly, isn't it? It's a parable about our prostitution with unsound teaching. It's a parable about our potential faithlessness with the word of God, with his commandments, with the gospel of Christ. That's really what Proverbs 7 is about for us, isn't it? You see how in verse 7, it's a young man who feels strong. That's always the case with youth, isn't it? When I was a young man, brothers and sisters, I could whack the world. I'd, I'd take on all comers, spiritually, not, not physically. I've never had much of a, a physique, you understand. But, but spiritually speaking, I, I was strong. I was baptized at, at the age of 14, and, and by 17 and 18, I, I was an arranging brother and doing all sorts of things. I felt strong. But let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There is an inclination in human nature, brothers and sisters, always to imagine that we are stronger than we are. There is always in in human nature a potential to overconfidence. Lord, though all men should deny thee, yet will not I. It's Peter, isn't it? On the very night in which he denied his Lord three times, even before the cock crew. So we need to be warned, don't we? If Peter can fall in that way, brothers and sisters, let's not be overconfident in the flesh. You can see how from verse 8 of Proverbs 7, here, the danger of playing with fire. That's what this young man is doing, isn't it? 
And we can so easily do the same ourselves in in different ways. It doesn't have to be literally a, a prostitute, brothers and sisters. There are all kinds of ways in which we might prostitute the faith which we have espoused. Can a man take fire into his bosom and and not be burnt? Of course not. It's not possible. The warnings are all set out for us here. The danger of of playing. And you see how in verse 10 of Proverbs 7, temptation is so attractive, isn't it? Never stands in front of you and says, "I'm, I'm temptation, I'm going to trip you up. It'd be easy to resist if it did, wouldn't it? Behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn and her feet abide not in her house. And she's so persuasive too, isn't she? You notice in verse 11 that she comes part way to meet him. That's what temptation does, brothers and sisters, doesn't it? Comes part way to meet us so often. In verse 14, sounds so good even appears to support the truth, doesn't it? What is it she says? I've, I've sacrificed my... I have peace offerings with me. This day I have paid my vows. What a, a good living person this is, apparently, from the outside. That's how temptation approaches us, brothers and sisters, in precisely that way, sounding good, appearing to support what we're about, appearing to support our principles. And then in verse 15 comes the flattery that appeals to the ego. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. Oh, that makes you feel good, doesn't it? That's how temptation works so often in our lives. And in verses 19 and and 20, the good man is not at home. He has gone a, a long journey. It's our Lord, brothers and sisters, isn't it? It's Christ. He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. Our Lord, our Master tarries. There is no no urgency. We lose that sense of urgency about his coming. And temptation is in those circumstances so easy to give way to. And verse 22 describes so capably, it seems to me, the tension that temptation arouses within us. He goeth after her straightway. Suddenly he snaps. That's how temptation works, isn't it? We resist it for for, for a while. And we struggle. And and we think about it. Unlike Joseph, perhaps, we don't get out of the house, do we, immediately. We consider it. We we weigh it up. And that creates a tension which suddenly gives. And we fall prey to it. He goeth after her straightway. As an ox goes to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Can you see, brothers and sisters, what Proverbs 7 is really all about? And the coincidences that between this chapter and Deuteronomy 6 are not accidental. Solomon is talking to his son, maybe his sons, about the need to keep God's commandments in their heart. To hear and to obey. To obey them out of affection, out of love for them, and to teach them to the generations to come in faithfulness, because this is their life. That's what gives the clue to the real meaning behind Proverbs 7. It's, it's, It's verbal links, and there are more than those obvious ones that I have pointed out to you in the first few verses there. We haven't time clearly to go through them all. But here, brothers and sisters, is the evidence, it seems to me, of the necessity of hearing God's voice in our lives. Something which, for us, just as it was for Israel, can sometimes be uncomfortable. Maybe sometimes it's not really what we want to do in our heart of hearts. The flesh pulls away. The word is demanding, and it is. It will demand every ounce of energy and strength that you can put into it to obey and to keep this word properly. It can sometimes be very uncomfortable hearing on a Sunday morning or in our private daily Bible readings, day by day. It can tell us things that we would rather not have heard. 
It can tell us that our conduct is not right, that our feet are facing in the wrong direction. But it is vitally important, brothers and sisters, that we hear what it says. However uncomfortable the experience may be, it is an essential experience. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. Ye heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude, only ye heard a voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments. And he wrote them upon two tables of stone. Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as thou hast heard and live? Out of heaven he made thee to hear his voice, that he might instruct thee. And upon earth he showed thee his great fire. And thou heardest his words out of the midst of the fire. And because he loved thy fathers, therefore he chose their seed after them. Thou shalt keep therefore his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee this day, that it may go well with thee, and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days upon the earth, which the Lord, thy God, giveth thee forever. Brothers and sisters, if Israel had such a privilege as that, as to hear the voice of Yahweh speaking out of the midst of the fire upon Mount Sinai and live, how much greater is the privilege that we have received of hearing his voice through the scriptures and through this word made flesh in the person of his son. This is our life. Let's not prostitute what we have heard or treat it lightly, but ensure that it is not only in our hearts, but pass on to however many generations might remain until the coming of our Lord.